Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal mystery, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers. Though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty. Because he surrendered himself to death, and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many, and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud voices, with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be Thanks to God.
Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden, into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had conceded, who had counseled the Jews, that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. What he has said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent, his bound, sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, you are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of, of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, 
Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him, so Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out. If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement in Hebrew. Gabbatha. Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it, see who it would be. 
in order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified that his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. Unfortunately, we're not gathering here as we typically do on this holy night. And I say that, of course, because we are not physically here together in our church as we usually are. Sadly, we can't do that because of the pandemic. The very personal and painful reality that we're all sharing on this Good Friday night. And so we are together thanks to the gift of technology it is the only safe way we can come together to honor the Lord's passion and death, and very importantly, to reach out in love and support of each other. We just heard the profound and moving story of our Lord's final hours on earth. It is a story we have heard often over the years, and a story we know well. It is my hope and prayer that tonight, however, you heard that story at a deeper and more profound level 
than you've ever heard it before. I hope you did not just hear and end understand it, but that you entered into it and experienced it in a very personal way. It is my hope and prayer that in this time of pandemic, you heard the story of the Lord's passion and death with what the Jewish scriptures call a listening heart. A listening heart is a concept found in the first book of Kings. There it is told that when Solomon was made king of Israel, he asked the Lord to help him rule well by giving him Lev Shema, which in English means a listening heart. I'm sure he asked for that because he realized that in order to lead the nation and to lead it well, he would need an open and receptive heart. A listening heart. And so that's what he asked for, and the Lord granted his request. And that is why even to this day, Solomon is remembered as a man of great wisdom, wisdom made possible by the listening heart the Lord blessed him with. I would maintain as well that we too need listening hearts to live our lives well. And that need has probably never been greater than it is right now in the midst of this pandemic with all its dangers and uncertainties. But to fully enter into and appreciate the importance of a listening heart, it requires that we be open and receptive to the significance and importance of symbols. And of course, the most preeminent symbol of our Christian faith is the cross of Jesus Christ, the cross on which he died for each and every one of us, the cross that we honor and venerate this evening. This powerful symbol, more than any other, captures the essence and points to the heart of all we believe, all we count on, namely the love of our God, our God who is love itself. Important as the cross is, however, I think it's quite possible to look at it and to see or emphasize the wrong things. For example, when you look at the cross, what do you see? For you, is it primarily a symbol of humanity's guilt for sin, including your sin? It is certainly possible to see the cross in that light. And in fact, it is true that guilt for sin is part of what the cross of Christ does stand for. But surely, Jesus didn't suffer and die on the cross to underscore and emphasize human guilt. And he most certainly didn't die on the cross to oppress and burden us with even more guilt. There is nothing about the life of Jesus Christ or the gospel he preached that points to that conclusion. On the contrary, he died on the cross to liberate us from guilt not to glorify it by making the cross its primary symbol. So, if the cross of Christ is not intended to be a symbol of human guilt, then what is it a symbol of? Perhaps, as some have argued, the answer is that it is the symbol of the necessity of suffering in human life. After all, Jesus suffered repeatedly during his life on earth and he certainly suffered horribly during his passion and death. However, to see the cross in that light is, I think, to miss the meaning and purpose of it entirely. And yet, that is what many over the centuries have done with this central symbol of our faith. They have distorted it into some perverse justification, even exaltation of human suffering. Well, my friends, that is heresy, and that has been condemned as such for many centuries. And very sadly, it is a heresy that still has its advocates. In fact, some even today argue that this dreadful pandemic is God's infliction of suffering on humanity as a punishment for sin. And that too, of course, is heresy. The fact is that Jesus never suggested there was anything good about human suffering. On the contrary, he fought against suffering whenever and wherever he encountered it. When people came to him to be relieved of their suffering, he helped them. 
He healed their blindness and their deafness, their lameness and their disease. He fed the hungry and comforted the sorrow, and he lifted the burden of guilt and shame from the sinful. Yes, it is true that he also insisted that we must all pick up our crosses daily and follow him. But to pick up the cross and follow him is not to embrace suffering for its own sake or as punishment. No, it is to accept the fact that in helping other people and in bringing solace, compassion, and love into people's lives, it will sometimes cost us and cost us dearly. That is the cross we are asked to carry, not suffering for suffering's sake and not suffering as punishment. What then is the cross of Jesus a sign of, a symbol of? Quite simply, but very profound, the message of the cross of Christ that we venerate tonight is above all else, the sign and the proof that we are loved with a love beyond all telling. Jesus once said, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Tonight, we humbly and gratefully acknowledge that is precisely what he has done for each one of us. Yes, we are in the midst of a brutal and frightening pandemic. However, that sad and terrible reality does not negate, nor can it ever negate, the salvation Christ has already won for us. And so even in these frightening and dangerous times, let us be a loving, united, and mutually supported people a people who trust the Lord's guarantee that our destiny is not death, but the fullness of life and the fullness of life forever. May that message and that assurance help us all get through this terrible and trying time. And may it make all of us more loving, inclusive, and accepting of each other. After all, the Lord loves each and every one of us. Can there be any doubt, therefore, that he expects that we have and show that same love for each other. May the Lord bless each of us with a listening heart this Good Friday, and may that be his message to each and every one of us, a message we make our own and prove by the way we live each and every day of our lives.
O mighty and our living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for Archbishop Cardinal Joseph Tobin, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty and ever living God, by the Spirit, the whole body of the Church is sanctified and covered. Hear our humble prayers for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Christ, 
that by walking before you with a sincere heart, that they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love, and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty ever living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant we pray that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of your good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of the human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty and ever-loving God, in whose hand lies every human heart, and the rights of all people. Look with faith, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion, may through your gift be made secure, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty ever living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you that all may rejoice because of the hour of their need. Your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all enduring the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, the sick and the dead, those who feel lost or dismayed, as well as those who care for the sick. Though chastised now by affliction, may they find relief at last through God's loving memory. Almighty oh, and merciful God, Look with compassion on our affliction, lighten our burden, and so confirm our faith, that we may always trust without hesitation in your Father, the Providence, through Christ our Lord. Amen.
the Savior's command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
for thy kingdom, kingdom, the power, the power and the glory of yours, now, now and forever. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but I always say the word, my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, who has restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, 
that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people, who have honored the death of your Son, in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you all for joining us on this most solemn of nights. Thank you for your continued support. We hope you join us tomorrow evening at 8.15 p.m. for the Easter Vigil Mass and Celebration. Our Lady of Mount Carmel is with you always. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, pray for us.